Hello and welcome to today's 1152 Club. My name is Kitty Ross and I'm the curator of Leeds History and Social History. And today I'm going to have a look through the museum collections to try and pin down exactly who is Father Christmas. Is he the same person as Santa Claus? Does he really exist? And does he have anything much to do with the Christian feast of Christmas, which celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ? Certainly there's no mention of Father Christmas or Santa Claus in the Bible. Anyway, it's not a simple question, but I think we'll have fun having a look. So I thought we'd start by having a look at this Roman coin, which certainly features a bearded man. It represents the god Saturn. The Romans celebrated his feast at Saturnalia, which was usually held between the 17th and 23rd of December and straddled the winter solstice or shortest day. The winter solstice is an important ritual time in many traditions, including the pagan festival of Yule. The Saturnalia festival had many similarities to our modern Christmas in that it involved feasting and gift giving, in some instances, a king of Saturnalia would be elected who had the job of handing out presents. The festivities at Saturnalia also encouraged a brief relaxation of social norms with the, the world turned upside down, so that slave owners waited on their slaves, women dressed as men and vice versa, and there was plenty of gambling, all of which have echoes in our Christmas traditions of pantomime and playing games. However, Saturn did have a dark side since he was reputed to have eaten his own children, so this makes him a slightly less family friendly than the modern Father Christmas. In this slide we have an image of a Roman oil lamp which depicts another personage who seems to prefigure our Christmas traditions. It shows the god Mithras, who was worshipped particularly by Roman soldiers. The Mithras cult was popular around the same time as early Christianity, and there were some for similar features. Mithras was reputed to have had a form of virgin birth, in that he was born from a cleft in a rock, and he was visited by shepherds as an infant. His birth seems to have been celebrated on the 25th of December. This date was also the feast of another Roman sun god called Sol Invictus, so the two gods may have been conflated. Mithraic rituals also involved elaborate feasts and the preparation of special food. However, Mithras is not a very plausible prototype for Father Christmas in that he was usually depicted nude and without a beard. Once the early Christian church became the official religion, the followers of Mithras were persecuted. However, many early churches were built above Mithraic shrines and by the 4th century AD, the church settled on the 25th of December as the date to celebrate the birth of Jesus. This next slide shows a medieval seal that brings us a bit closer to Father Christmas, but not in a way that we would immediately recognise. It is the seal of the Abbey of St Nicholas at Beely in Essex from about 1330. Here is St Nicholas represented as a bishop in his clerical robes. St Nicholas was a real historical figure who lived from 270 to 343 and was Bishop of Myra in present day Turkey. Like most saints, he is an austere figure and doesn't superficially resemble the modern Santa Claus, but traditionally bishops do wear red robes. He certainly had little to do um, with life at the North Pole. However, after his death became associated with a number of miracles and stories that involved generosity and gift giving. He's also particularly associated with kindness to children, especially after the miracle when he managed to bring back to life three boys who had been chopped up, salted down during a famine. St. So Nicholas is the patron saint of a wide range of people, and this includes students and sailors. One miracle tells of how he managed to calm the sea during a stormy voyage. And perhaps showing his generosity of spirit, he is also the patron saint of repentant thieves, prostitutes, unmarried people and brewers. 
so maybe he wouldn't have disapproved too much of people enjoying a bit of alcohol at Christmas. And strangely, he is also the patron saint of pawnbrokers. This is one of the stranger links to the Christmas traditions that we associate with Santa Claus. In one story, St Nicholas is said to have visited a family who were in such financial difficulty that they were about to prostitute their three daughters. In order to save the girls from this fate, St Nicholas secretly arranged to drop three bags of gold down their chimney to provide enough money for each of them to have a wedding dowry. The three bags evolved into the pawnbroker's sign, and this story is the origin of the practice of gifts being delivered via the chimney. In another little twist, the three balls of gold also sometimes metaphorically were associated with oranges, um, which were winter fruits, and may help explain the tradition of putting a tangerine or orange in a Christmas stocking. This slide shows a Russian figure of St Nicholas, which actually was owned by the housekeeper at Lotherton Hall in the 1950s, and shows another representation of um, St Nicholas in his um, clerical robes, although this time they're very um, much warm and wintry and not red, but white. In many parts of Europe, it is St Nicholas who brings children gifts and not always at Christmas itself. His Saints Day is celebrated on the 6th of December. So in countries such as Germany, that is the main occasion when children are given presents. As a saint, he was also reputed to have secretly left coins in people's shoes. So that is another tradition that is practiced in European countries. This image is taken from an 1860s magic lantern slide, so it may be one of our earliest images showing an actual Santa Claus or Father Christmas. It was probably made in southern Germany and shows many of the Christmas traditions that started there before being introduced to England. You may spot a couple of Christmas trees full of rather dangerous candles, and the Father Christmas figure seems to have a fur trimmed red cloak and a big sack of toys. The kneeling angel is a reminder that it was also a Christian festival. And here we have a Christmas card dated 1861. We assume that the old man with a white beard is probably Father Christmas, but you will notice that he is dressed in blue and he might just be an old man who likes feeding holly to the birds. The transition from the Bishop St Nicholas into the modern figure of Santa Claus occurred when Dutch migrants moved to the United States, bringing their version of St Nicholas, who they knew as Sinterklaas. A lot of the attributes that we now associate with Santa Claus were popularised by the publication of this poem written by Charles Clement Moore in 1822. It famously begins, "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St Nicholas soon would be there. This beautiful colour printed copy of The Night Before Christmas was published in New York in 1888. You may notice, however, that although very recognisable, this Santa Claus is dressed in green. It is Charles Moore's poem that first really introduces the idea of Santa arriving on a sleigh with reindeer and he gives them names, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer and Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner and Blitzen. Down the chimney St Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. Santa Claus is described as having a white beard with twinkly eyes and rosy cheeks. He is also pot-bellied and depicted as chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, which is a strong contrast to the tall and lean Bishop St Nicholas. One aspect of Charles Moore's Santa Claus seems to have been quietly forgotten in recent times. In the poem, he smokes a pipe. And here we have a set of magic lantern slides based on the Walt Disney Silly Symphonies cartoon version of the poem from 1933. It somehow involves Mickey Mouse, 
It was certainly not mentioned in the original verses. So we've had a look at how the American Santa Claus emerged from the traditions of St Nicholas. But is this really interchangeable with the English figure of Father Christmas? To help think about this, I thought I'd introduce another bearded Roman god. So here is a marble sculpture of Bacchus, excavated by Lord Savile in the ruins of Lanuvium. Bacchus was the god of agriculture, wine and fertility, and is often shown wreathed in vines and ivy. If we have a look at this 1836 illustration drawn by Robert Seymour, we can see an embodiment of Father Christmas who looks a lot more like Bacchus than a saintly bishop. Not only does he have holly and ivy in his hair and a bowl of punch in his hands, he is also riding on a goat. The most famous depiction of Father Christmas in English literature is probably that of Charles Dickens in the story A Christmas Carol, which was first published in 1843. He's not actually called Father Christmas in the book, but both the spirit of Christmas past and the spirit of Christmas present resemble a traditional Father Christmas, and they are usually illustrated dressed in green robes with garlands of winter greenery such as holly and ivy. In this, they also echo the folklore folklore figure of the green man. Above all, he embodies all the virtues of generosity, feasting and merrymaking, which are the antithesis of Scrooge's miserly attitudes. The illustrations shown here appeared in the 1892 Pears Annual and are by the watercolour artist and illustrator Charles Green. This next illustration is from the Illustrated London News 1876 Christmas issue and appears to show a Father Christmas figure holding a child in a pose that echoes that of the Madonna and child. In contrast, this illustration is from a card game called Triplum, printed about 1900, and shows Father Christmas in fetching pink, bringing his own Christmas tree with him. And here we have an invitation from the Bramley Children's Guild to their Christmas tea and entertainment. And it shows a Father Christmas figure with his fur trimmed long coat bringing presents for the children of Bramley in 1913. This rather poignant postcard is from our Leeds Rifles collection and dates from World War I. And it shows a Father Christmas spirit bringing some seasonal comforts to the troops. In this Round Trees chocolate label from the 1920s, Father Christmas is again dressed in his fur trimmed red coat rather than a Santa suit, and he has a holly trim on his hat. And here is another chocolate label from Round Trees, this time showing Father Christmas adorned with holly and a single reindeer pulling his sleigh. This American song was written by Lanny Rogers and Spencer Williams for Christmas 1939 at the beginning of the Second World War. And the lyrics relate to the heartache of war and end with the line, I'm sending my letter to Santa Claus to bring daddy safely home to me. It was sung by both Gracie Fields as on this song sheet and also by Vera Lynn. By the 1950s, the image of Father Christmas in England as a fat, jolly figure in a red suit with a big belt rather than a long hooded cloak was increasingly dominant, as in these 1950s adverts for Youngman's Restaurant in Leeds. But the cloaked and hooded Father Christmas also survives, as in this Christmas tableau in City Square from about 1960. However, this photograph from about the same date shows a sign outside Leeds Railway Station which plumps for the Santa suit as the correct attire. For generations of Leeds children, the place where they would meet Father Christmas or Santa face to face was at Lewis's department store. 
Lewis's original shop in Liverpool had opened its first Christmas Fairyland Grotto in 1877, and the annual Christmas Fair was brought to Leeds in 1932 when the branch on the hedgerow opened, and it continued until it closed in 1995. We have a large collection of Christmas cards at Abbey House. So here are a selection of cards showing different interpretations of Father Christmas, including on this slide, a cross-dressing one from 1969. And these two cards from the 1960s also show changes in social attitudes and perhaps a feeling that some children expected rather too many toys at Christmas. These two Christmas cards from the 1990s were sent to museum staff from the printing firm of Warrens and show Santa Claus cheerfully helping them with their deliveries. And in this sweet little card from 1985, Santa seems to have upgraded his transport courtesy of Radio Air. And I'm really not quite sure what to say about this card um, from Leeds Leisure Services Department from the 1990s, which seems to show a confused Father Christmas vandalising the town hall. And for another distinctive take on uh, Santa imagery, here is a card showing a festive Karl Marx from the Radical Postcard Publishers Leeds Postcards. Finally, I thought we would have a quick look at the history of the Christmas stocking, as that is what every child hopes Father Christmas will stop with presents. This tradition seems to stem back to the legends of St Nicholas and his habit of hiding money in people's shoes. Originally, it would have been one of the child's own socks, which wouldn't hold very much. This stocking dates from the 1820s and was used by several generations as a Christmas stocking until it was donated to the museum. This Ernest Nister card from the 1900s also shows fairly modest sized stockings. I'm not sure when the first commercially made Christmas stockings were produced, but this one dates from about 1920 and was made by Barrington Co of the Jelly Baby fame. Strangely, it has never been opened. So to finish, I would like to share this little cartoon which appeared in the 1943 staff magazine for Wilkinson and Warburton's of Leeds. It's a bit baffling, but it plays on the idea that as children grow up, they be may begin to suspect that Father Christmas doesn't exist and may just be their parents playing make-believe. But it's also a warning not to break the blackout regulations or Hitler might just come in and sneak in instead. So I'll leave it there and wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you.